Okay, Rabbi, so we're on Daf Peches, and we're almost, I would say, three quarters of the way down Peches Amaral. But I want to call your attention today to Tosus Dibra Maschal Midi, which you'll see. Uh, what's the easiest way of, uh, of mentioning this? If you want to count Tosus in up from the bottom, it's five, one, two, three, four. It's the fifth Tosus up from the bottom, or it's the, I believe, the fifth, or the fourth Tosus down from the top. You may recall yesterday, just re to re reiterate the Gemara, we were trying to prove that Eid Echad is believed even against a chazak, meaning we have a chazak, an assumption that is Easter here. You have fruits or grains that were harvested and he did not take off trumas and maestres to the best of our knowledge and therefore becomes tevel. Or, for example, he was magdish something for hegdesh. And in both these cases, the aid echad testifies that he already took trumas and maestres. He was poda the hegdesh. And the Gemara vacillates back and forth. Do we believe him against a chezkas isur? Because again, it has Cheskis Tevel, Cheskis Hegdish before he testified. And on this particular Gemara, the Gemara assumes that he's believed. And to the same extent that he's believed against the Cheskis Iser in the case of Tevel and Hegdish, by analogy, he should be believed against the Cheskis Eishis Ish to testify that her husband died and allow her to get remarried. Rectosis, the Tomar. I don't understand the analogy. You may be right that in Tevel and Hegdish is a Cheskes Isha, and in Isha is also Cheskes Isha, but Ein Dovich of Erepachas Nichnayin. The Torah says that you require two Edom and a Dovich of Erep. So if a man is getting married, he must have two witnesses to testify that he got married. If a man delivers a divorce and get to his wife, he has to have two wit witnesses to testify on the get. And now we're talking about Misa Sabah. You need two witnesses to testify that the husband died. To make a long story short, the Torah itself in the Dovish of Arab, when it comes to Arayos, requires two Aden. And now you're quoting to be Tevel and Hegdesh. With all the respect, Tevel and Hegdesh is not a Dovish of Arab. It's what we call a Dovish of Isa. And with regard to Dovish of Isa, the Torah relies on one witness, Aid Echon Nem Surin. Yesterday, we discussed two categories. It could be a testimony or it could be on Biyada, when he himself could have fixed up these. But now we're talking about a Dovah Shemera. So what analogy does Gemara have? You've proven to me, again, the Gemara is going to reject this proof, and Eid Echad is, ne is Nevon against the Cheskes Isra in, in, in Tevel and, and, uh, and Hegdish. But what good does that do me? I want to explain our Mishnah, which relies on one aid to be Matur and Eish Based on his testimony that may spiral. That's a Dovah Shabbat. The Omer read. The Iyav Hitshayach Lameleth Mitevel Vehegdich. If our attempt to derive the Nemonis of Eidechon in the cases of Tevel and Hegdich would have been a successful attempt, then Hava Mino. We would reinterpret this principle called Ein Dovish Verapoks Mishnayim. The high, the Ein Dovish Verapoks Mishnayim, Hani Mililili Osra Al Bailo. There's a difference between creating an Easter and removing an Easter. The Ein Ein Echad Nemon Lesser. The Leinion Easter Ksiv Ki Motzaba Erbas Dov. This is a pretty revolutionary tosis. Tosis differentiates here between the posse. The posse itself is critical here. We know a dover shabbat pox mishnayim based on exerah shabbat dover dover mi mamon. In the parish of mamon, it says al pishnayim edim yakum dover. And the word Dover appears 
requiring two Adam for Dover in Mum. And in the parish of Erva, it says, Ki Motzaba Ervas Dover. And therefore, Dover in this parish of Arias likewise requires two Adam. Hence, Ain Dover Shabbat Pox Mishnah. Says Tosus, let's look carefully at the context of this possible. The Pasuk is talking about Ki Matzaba Ervas Dov, which is what we call Sota. It means that a man finds out that his wife was involved in a, uh, a in a Mises Nuts, in an extramarital affair. And that's going to bust up the marriage because he can no longer remain married to his wife if she had that affair. How do we clarify and establish beyond shadow of a doubt through evidence that she had that affair? We need to aid them because the Torah says, Ki But in our case, we want to determine that her husband died so to allow her to marry someone else. That's not Ki On the contrary, it's just the opposite of Ki Matzabar. Ki means if she had this relationship, she can no longer live with her husband. So that's called Dovar Le'isura. But we're looking for a different kind of testimony, a testimony that the goal of which is not to create an Easter and bust up a marriage, but rather to create a heter to allow her to marry another man, to free her from this marriage. Now, Rabotzai, at the end of the day, to take an Asian Zish and be Matir, that is a Dover Shabbat And in fact, if a woman wants the claim that she received to get from her husband, she will have to produce two witnesses. Why not say, wait a minute, the get is only Latera. We can rely on one witness. It's not like Himatsabar of a Dover, which is Lisura, and there we require two witnesses. Again, you could always argue that there's a hekesh between Kiddushin and, and Gittin, that just like Kiddushin is creating an Easter and Get is being matter in Easter, yet there's an equation between the two. But I believe that there's a different answer to this question. What creates a Dovachev error and defines that category, and therefore we require two witnesses, is a Maisa Shabbat Let me explain. When a man marries a woman, that's a Maisa Shabbat He engages in a Maisa Kiddush. When a man divorces his wife, that's a Maisa Erev. Because the Nosan Biyada, the Torah says, you have to give the get into her hand. If a woman, heaven forbid, has an extramarital relationship, that's a Maisa Shebe'er. That Maisa Bia, that Snus, generates an Iser al Bailo, the Iser of Sot of Anitma. And we need testimony on a Maisa Erva with two Aven. That's called Kimatsu Ba'erva Stone. The death of her husband is not a Maisa Shebe'er. It's just a matter of clarifying the reality. What took place? Is the man alive or never the opposite? With that, we need testimony that serves as evidence. And if the testimony of one aid is sufficient evidence to break up a cheskas isur in the cases of Tevel and Hegdesh, then it means that as far as isur Vater is concerned, the Torah relies on the testimony of one witness. In a Dover Shebra Mama, the Torah requires two witnesses, and the Torah upgraded its demands or status of evidence. And by virtue of the Xer Shava, if the evidence is being brought in to a Maisa Shebra, that's a Dover Shebra. Dover Shebra means Maisa Shebra. The Torah says that if a woman's husband dies and she's an Almana, she's allowed to marry someone else. But I would not say that his death is a Maisa Shabbat. We just need to clarify, is the man alive or not? And the Eid Echad said, unfortunately, or tragically, I saw his, his corpse. I saw his dead body. He's testifying not on a Maisa. 
In fact, as far as the aid is concerned, it's irrelevant how he died. He's not present to see the knife go into his heart if he was murdered, or if he died on the uh, on the surgery ta on the sur table of surgery in the hospital. That's not his business. He recognizes the dead body of this woman's husband, which we in Hebrew we call it Hakara, who makir it a mess, and he can testify as evidence. But when is a Maisa Shiva Erva? The Torah requires for a Maisa Shiva Erva, like a Maisa Shiva Mama, on two witnesses. And her Znus is a Maisa Shiva Erva. The aid is not testifying on a Mitzius, on a reality. He's not recognizing anything. He is testifying on an action. And that action breaks up the marriage relationship. And therefore, it's no different than a get. and certainly requires two aid. But our case, where he's testifying to be Matur and HSH by claiming that he, he identified he, he could identify the body of the of, of the dead husband. And he unfortunately he can't bring it into Bezin. He doesn't have access to the corpse. I mean, then we could do DNA testing or whatever they do now in Surfside. So I don't know what they do. But uh, but he's testifying that he, you know, that he knows. Because he saw the dead body. He knows that this woman's husband died. And the Gemara thinks that if we could prove from Kevel and Hegdesh that an aid is believed to establish an Isa, I'm sorry, to establish a Heta on a pre existing Isa, which we know existed, it's got a Chazaka, a life of its own, then he could believe, be believed to be not to the Isravacious even though there's a Cheskes Isa. That's what I think Tosis has in mind. Now, before we go on in the sugya to what I call the bomb that the Gemara is going to to drop over here, a real radical change. Let's just go over a couple of highlights of the sugya before this breakthrough, as I call it. The breakthrough, by the way, is called Rabbi Zera, Rabbi Zera's famous breakthrough. But before we get to Rabbi Zera, let's just reiterate two very important points. Number one, would the Eid Echad be believed against the Chazaka? The Gemara seems to say it depends on another variable, and that is the Yadah. So the Gemara says the following. In a case where you have a suffix in identifying a Chaticha, you don't know whether it's Chelev or Shuman, there's no Cheskes Yisur, then Eid Echad is certainly believed. But in the case of this Chazik Yisura, where we know that this was or is a piece of Chelev, then all the witnesses in the world cannot change that. And beyond that, if we're not sure if this Tevel had been subject to Hafrasha or not, how do you know that Eich is believed? If it's Biyado, fine. If it's not the other, I could say, for example, it's your table, and I don't know if I can be mafresh from you. That depends on whether you need das bailin. But let's assume you need das bailin. I can't be mafresh your table. Then why should I be believed to testify in something that has a cheska sisu table that there was true surmises were removed? And Minolan, how do you know such a So the Gemara again, I just reiterate the Gemara. It says, "Hi Tevel Hechi Dom, Idi Day Mishum to be other Lesakna." He's believed against the Cheskes Iser because he could have actually been mafresh the Chumas of Meisus on his own, like the case we mentioned yesterday with Nido, who says that she went to Mikvush. It's Biyada, but if it's the Acher, Mikasol, 
if you're going to tell me that Sarat does Bailin, and he says, I know that Shuvah Samaisis were removed, is he Gufa Minola? What is your source to establish that he is believed? Where do you know that from? He's testifying as one single aid against the Cheskas Isu. And there's no Biyadah because Tzrich of Das Bayer. And the Gemara goes through the same thing with regard to Hekish. But now I want to point out something else. Let's talk about a Chiv Karb. And a witness comes in, points his finger at Ruven, and says, Ruven, you a Chalim. And therefore, you are high of a carbon chattis. So the Rabbanon say that he's believed. When is he believed? When the, we call him Ruven, the so-called criminal, again, it's unintentional, so we shouldn't really call him a criminal in the full sense of the word, but he is negligent. When the criminal denies the, the, te the testimony of the witness and he says, no, I did not eat chelev, then you can't force a chelev down his throat because the Torah says, that he has to know himself. We may have to remind him and stimulate his memory, but at the end of the day, he agrees and he doesn't reject the testimony of the Adem. However, the Chachamim go very far and they say that if he denies that he ate chalif, even if two witnesses, etc., would testify that he ate chalif, he's not high of a carbon. He's part of But the mayor says he's high of a carbon because since two witnesses are always believed, and they could bring a death penalty upon a, an accused capital criminal, and certainly how much more so should they believe in a shogeg issue about bringing a car. But Rabbi Meir disagreed. I'm sorry, the Chacham reject Rabbi Meir, and they say no. Even if he denies the testimony of X number of witnesses, it doesn't matter. It still is part. But in a case where he doesn't deny it, and the Chacham says he's high of a karma. Now, certainly, as a Cheskas, so to speak, no Kashus, that he didn't eat Chalet. And now the Eid is believed to point their opponent to be Machayev and Makarma Chatas, testifying that he ate Chalet. So the Gemara thinks that in such a case, we have a very strong basis. Or concluding that an Eidech is, is believed against the Chazor. The Gemara says no. You have no proof. Because the fact that he, Reuven, did not deny the claim of the aid, that puts him into a category called Shtika Kodadam. So we're not relying on the testimony of the aid. He's not believed. But rather, we're relying on the shtika koda. Hoda means that, in effect, the so-called criminal admits that he ate chayyim, and that's why he's chayyim the problem. Not because we're relying on the aid. The aid is only the backdrop to set up shtika koda by pointing the finger at Reuven and saying, "Reuven, you ate chayyim," and Reuven doesn't contradict him. It means that Reuven admits that he ate chayyim. But the machayim of carbon is not the testimony of the aid, but rather the shtika koda of the criminal. Now, I want to make an attempt 
I'm not sure we'll be successful. We'll try it if you don't mind. At figuring out what bar this toast is here, Dibar Maskil Dishtika Ko Dadai, which is the first of the wide lines in Tosis. Says Tosis, Pirish, even the Shasak, when the aide came in and testified that Ruvain, you ate Chalim, and Ruvain did not deny it, is Shtika Nira Sha'ed made Emes. That the again, I use the word the criminal, the, the accused eating chela, eater of chela, must know a little bit that he ate chela. What does that mean, a little? Right? Is it shtika koto? Is it not koto? What, what does it mean? The Odeak Tsats. Says Tosis, she yech raglayim ledov. I mean, literally, there are feet on the ground. What does that mean, raglayim ledov? Raglayim Ladova means, again, it's not a literal translation, that there's circumstantial evidence that indicates a certain conclusion. We don't have testimony, but when we take everything into consideration, it looks like the conclusion that we want to draw, derive or draw. That's called Raglayim Ladova. And I believe that its counterpart in English would be circumstantial evidence. So the Gemara has her Glyam Ludova in Mesechtic Subis in a case where a man finds his wife in a very uncompromising situation. He did not witness what's called Kim Cholbish Forest, which means the actual penetration. But everything else he saw, I don't want to go into detail, but you could fill in the, 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 the details. And that's called Raglayim Ledov. When the Torah requires one witness, Raglayim Ledov could substitute for a witness. And if a man hears from a witness that he ate chalev, I don't know if I believe the witness, but there's Raglayim Ludov that he must have ate chalev. Maybe he doesn't know for sure that he ate chalev. He's Yodek Tzas. He knows that there was a piece of chalev there on the table. And, you know, he got distracted. And then five minutes later, the, the, the chalev is gone. And, he, you know, he feels a little satiated. So he concludes, based on the circumstances, that he probably ate the chalif inadvertently, not deliberately. He got caught up in whatever he got caught up in. Avolekel lememer hoda mamish sheyodea vada. We're not talking about a case, and we don't even require this halachically, that he makes an implicit statement through his silence that he knows that he ate chalif and he's absolutely sure of it. Sheodea bevada shekem emetu shosu. What is bothering this Tosis? Tosis is creating a whole sophisticated, I call it castles in the sky, that the shtika koda should not be taken literally that he is, by, by virtue of his silence, admitting that he knows he ate chalif, 
but rather circumstances seem to indicate in his mind that he ate chalet. But any other of that, what bothers us? In Cain. Because if you were to tell me that Shtika Kodah means that we assume he knows that he ate chalet, then we're stuck with the Gemara and Amar, Imehemen Loch, the love gas lona who feel after if a person is believed, Mehemen Loch, that he's not a Gazlan, feel after, take it out of your shoes. I feel Gazlan Nami. May Achashu shows him the Moshe Mefarish Rabbeinu Tam Chosom because Hahi the Gitten the time of the Yomulah Eid Echad Achalta Chelav Sharcha Nirva Vinitmu Tarosecha Valos Shosek the Neman Mishum Shtika Kododami to the Masik Chosa Pacha. So the Gemara. In Ksubis, the way that Rabbi Natam interprets the Gemara is based on an analogy to a Gemara in Gita, which says that Shtika called Doda. Now, the case in Kedushin is not a case where he says, by the eye. He only says, Ima Hemimloch, the Lav Gazlonahu. And if the Gemara in Gitin is the basis for the equation, the Gemara Gitin of, of Shastika Koda, then we're talking about a case where he's not definite about it. Now, I know it's getting a little late, and I want to share with you Rabbi Zera. So, Buli Neder, Buli Neder, I always have to say that. We'll see the Gemara in Kedushin tomorrow, and we'll begin to appreciate what Baal's toast is here about Shastika Koda. But right now we want to look at Reb Zera, and then I'll let you go. We're back to square one now. We have to figure out how the Mishnah knew that Eid Echad, who says that I know your husband is dead, is believed against the Cheskas Eishis. Amar Rabbi Zera. Make sure we all have the place. We're counting up from the bottom of Pechess. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines up. Bitoch chomer shechmarta oleo b'sofa, hikalta oleo b'tchilo. Remember that the Mishnah says that if her husband shows up alive and well, she went ahead and married a second man based on the testimony of one witness, then she is going to suffer very, very heavy penalties. She's not allowed to get married, remain married to the first husband. She can't remain married to the second husband. She loses Aksuba from the first husband. From the second husband, no one's going to have to bury her when she dies. And she cannot claim any sort of monetary benefits like the Aksuba. She's basically out. So all these chumros should be should serve as inhibitors. And if you have a better word for me, let me know. But what I mean by an inhibitor is that she's got to realize what are the repercussions here if she goes ahead and gets married? Is he kalto lebetchila? We can rely on her testimony. I'm sorry, rely, excuse me, on the testimony of one witness and on the fact that we know she would not take a, even a chance of getting married to another husband because of all the terrible penalties, penalties she'll be suffering if in event her husband is still alive and the witness is not telling the truth.
Now, this is called, as we'll soon see, and that'll be tomorrow, Isha Daika Uminsima, which means she's not going to rely on the testimony of one witness. She's not going to put herself in that vulnerable position that maybe her husband is still alive and all the repercussions she'll suffer from if he is, but rather she's going to go out and hire, I'm just, this is just a modern twist of, hire a private detective. You pay good money for that. She's going to do everything that she can to investigate and interrogate people on the streets, if need be, until she's absolutely convinced that her husband is dead. And only then will she get mad. But the question is, why did the Rabbana go through this? Why did the Rabbana just simply say she's not allowed to get married? We only have one witness. Why did the Rabbana say, you know what? We're going to impose upon her the whole slew of penalties in the event that her husband's still alive. That's going to certainly motivate her to do all the investigations of Daiko Mitzvah, and then we can allow her to get married. Lomi Yuktsuf, Lomi Dufshan. I don't want your sting and I don't want your honey, we tell the bee. Let's leave out all the chumas. And don't be makil and allow her to get married on the basis of one witness required two witnesses. So the more answers, Mishumi Guna, Ikilu Beira Bona, one of the most famous lines in all of Shat. We don't want this woman to have to suffer endlessly locked in a marriage when a husband is, is gone. We don't know that a husband is gone, but we can convince ourselves as the judges sitting on, on, the, on the case that a husband, in fact, is gone. How do we convince ourselves? Number one, we have a witness. Number two, we send her checking out you know, every single possibility until she's absolutely convinced. And then we're going to tell her the following. In event that you didn't do the right job, we called it the other day, due diligence, and your daiku mitzvah was not reliable, and it turns out that your husband is alive, there were some leaves or, you know, that you left unturned, that you didn't do the job that you had to do. And you should know, we are warning you, you will lose your ksuba, and you will not be able to marry, not the first one, not the second one, the mamzerim will be just be all over the place, you'll have children that are mamzerim. Imagine what she's going through, what she will go through. That's going to convince the Besman that she did all her diligence, all her research, and she is absolutely convinced that her husband is gone. That for the Vezdin is enough evidence to be makil in an Igun situation. Again, Igun means a woman who is tied down to a marriage endlessly and she cannot get out of the marriage. We will bend over backwards to try to find a loophole, so to speak. Not a loophole, but some evidence that will upgrade the aid to a status of like two Aiden, just like two Aiden the Torah believes because it's absolute reliable Aiders, so too will rely on the testimony of one Aid when we combine it together with Daiku Mitzvah, and we're going to allow her to get remarried to solve the problem of Eden. You know that after September 11, I don't know anything about this latest tragedy, there were 10 Agunos, there were 10 women and we didn't have the bodies of their husbands, married women. As you know, the towers went up in smoke. And the Bezdin was able to be Matir all 10. Most famous is the case of Beagle and Old Shalom, because he was on the cell phone with his wife until, until he perished. But this is the Parsha of Aguna, and all of the Sukhis of Aguna, and you can fill up this whole library with books about Aguna, starting with Rav Spector, Rav Yitzhak Khan Spector, he was the major uh, trailblazer in, in Aguna, 
But it goes on and on. The literature on Aguna still is being produced as we speak. It's all based on this sugya in Yavamas Taf Peichetz. We'll stop here in Eretz Hashem. We know it will continue, continue tomorrow. Have a great day.